uh, I don't know whether you can see the screen. It's got a great photo of my, my cat here, who uh, I joked when, that, well, I think I put it on the slide. <laughs> so um, when I, I used to work in marketing and uh, I decided to go freelance just to kind of give myself um, the best shot at, you know, living the dream of being a writer. Uh, but one of the big benefits is that there are no annoying co-workers. It's just I, I traded in all of my co-workers for a single cat and uh, he's more useful than them, uh, than they were as well. Uh, freelancing is like super popular because you can obviously work from anywhere with an Internet connection. Uh, so, again, especially during the during the pandemic, um, you know, the workflow that, that I have, I didn't really notice too much of uh, too much of a difference. There's obviously been changes in terms of, you know, companies are having to reevaluate their offering and stuff. So, you know, one of my clients pre pandemic was uh, a travel client that sells cruises. So nobody's really buying cruises in the middle of a pandemic. So then they're not, you know, hiring, uh, hiring workers, but for the most part, because it's just you and a computer, you can work from pretty much anywhere. And uh, it's yeah, it's super flexible. And obviously uh, you can focus on the jobs you want to focus on as well. So when I used to work in um, marketing, there was a lot of this, like, You'd have to you'd have to you'd have to work on who you had to work on effectively. So um, you'd get told, "Oh, we're bidding on this account," or you know, "We've just got some work from so and so." So um, there were times when there were clients I was I was having to work on that I felt like really uncomfortable working with, whether it's like um, you know gambling clients or um, you know there was one there was one client I won't I won't give the name away, but a very a very senior person at this client was getting involved in some really really shady like political stuff in in like south america and so i found this out and obviously i told everybody and it's like well you still kind of have to do it because we're getting paid to do it uh whereas i think when you're freelance you can you can turn down jobs like that or uh you know get get out of doing them a bit more i guess it's that that thing of you being your own boss um but there are drawbacks to freelancing and these are similar to the drawbacks of pursuing writing as a career in general. Um, I should point out here as well, So, because I, I thought about this um, before, before putting this workshop together. And um, well, there are, there are a few things. One, like I think the craft of writing, I think uh, if it's something that you're interested in, it's something that you keep learning your entire life. And it's quite hard to just do a 20 minute, 30 minute session of, you know, here's everything you need to do, you need, you need, to, need to know about writing. Uh, like the art, the art and craft of writing. So I wanted to talk more about making a living at it. And very few people are able to make a living just from book sales. Um, those who do tend to be your like super well-known authors who've, you know, they've got movie deals for their books and they're selling millions and millions of copies. Um, but what you can find is that by publishing, you kind of, um, you know, you can, you can get your work out there and you can make a bit of extra money, but also it enables you to do other stuff. So um, I'm sure in Stephen's case, for example, it's probably led to some great, you know, uh, speaking opportunities. Uh, you know, in my case, it allows me to charge a little bit more for um, my, you know, my hourly rate when I'm charging clients and stuff. So there are positives and negatives to it. Obviously, some of the negatives is there's less financial security. Uh, you also need more skills as well. So you, you're if you're a freelance writer or, or even you're trying to make any kind of living as a writer, it doesn't matter how good your writing is to a certain extent. You also need those people skills. You need, you know, time management. You need to be able to figure out how to file a tax return. And uh, there's no one to blame if you get it wrong as well. The other, one of the other uh, big drawbacks of freelancing as well is that stuff tends to ebb and flow, especially if you're lucky enough to get jobs where you're, um, you know, maybe you're, working on a magazine or your go if you know you're ghostwriting a book for somebody you'd, you'd find that you know there's this big chunk of time where you're ghostwriting the book and then suddenly you know you finish that project and everything goes dead or if you work in magazine publishing there's usually um you know you'll have a monthly you know hectic part each month two days before the magazine goes to print or whatever so there tends to be times when you're you know busier and then quieter again and also Obviously, it can get lonely at times when you're just sat in front of your computer all the time. So you need a, a really good, um, a really good pricey, a really good pitch. If you can, you know, a really good elevator pitch as well. We all know about elevator pitches. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's this whole idea that, you know, if you can. Imagine you're traveling in an elevator and you've got however many floors and the person you want to speak to gets in the elevator with you. Well. 
It's when you see them stab the button. If you see you're going to go five floors, you have a pitch prepared where you know you can deliver it in five floors. If you see them doing four floors, you have one for four. If you know they're only going to do one floor, then you have a pitch prepared that's only going to be for that one floor. So the idea is to develop a, a, a range of pitches, basically, to, to, um, to sell the idea. And initially, what you want is the punchiest, snappiest pitch you can have. I mean, again, talking to publishers and writers, you know, quite often they want a two line pitch. Mm. They want they want they want just two lines to say this is what the book's about. I mean, if you think about film posters as, as an example, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is Alien in space. No one can hear you scream. Everything you need to know about mm. the film is in that one. That's a one sentence pitch. You know, um, so they will want to see a pitch. They want to see a, a synopsis, a very tight, well-written synopsis, and probably a few of the best photographs, a few of the ones that you think, wow, I want this book. Look at these photographs. That's amazing. That's certainly been my experience from people I know who've done these mm -hmm. sorts of books. That's great advice. It's it's a bit unusual doing a, a photograph book and uh, Ken's wanting photo of the bowel. But anyway, let's leave that to one side for the minute. Um, <laughs> So they'd want to see a couple of photos to see about the quality um, because a lot of people take photos, but they just aren't the right up to scratch uh, to be published commercially. If you have a small audience in mind, it might be that you want to uh, not so much have a publisher, but a printer, uh, in which case you're determined it's going to be published no matter what. Uh, so for instance, um, um, God, his name's something going out of my head. Uh, Mark. Mark. Yeah, Mark's just he's had a, yeah, a, yeah. a book, you know, Visions of Wickham, Faces of Wickham. He's done a kind of a history book about Wickham with loads of photographs in it. And Mark, Mark's clearly an excellent photographer. But he didn't get it published by a publisher because there's not going to be a, a huge market for it. Mm. So if he sells 500 copies, he'd be delirious with joy. Um so he's got good enough photos and some text. So he's got it laid out and done a deal with the printer uh, to get a publisher to take it on and take on all the cost and the risk. You'd have to have some pretty amazing photographs and a really special uh, sell with it. And I, that, you know, that would be maybe a bit unusual. Um, so you can get it printed. They're expensive mm. to produce. They're expensive to do. Really so expensive to produce. You're, you're would be setting yourself a very hard task to get someone to pay you to print it. But, you know, maybe they will because it's so fabulous and we don't know the details. Yeah, I think I suppose as well that also it does kind of help that publishers that do tend to produce those kind of books, they tend, again, they tend to specialise in it as well. So um, it might even be worth looking up if there are any, you know, specialist publishers that do specialise. Doing it that. also helps if if, the, if if it's a photo book about a subject that has already a huge mm. existing fan base, that changes things as well. Like a friend of mine has just written a book all about a guy called Martin Bauer. Now, you guys have probably never even heard of Martin Bauer, but to a certain section of the community, he's God, because Martin was the guy who built all the spaceships for all the Jerry Anderson mm. TV series and for movies. He built the original ships in the film Alien. So he's just brought out a photograph book of all the behind the scenes photographs of Martin Bauer and it's sold in the thousands. Another thing to think about when you've got your book and you're wanting to persuade somebody to take you on as an agent or to publish you is who you are as a person. Um, and I don't mean who you are, but what's the version of yourself that you're going to be telling people about? So um, if it was me, I'd be saying, well, I will, I grew up. So my book is set in Northern Ireland in the 1950s, so before my time. But I could say, oh, I grew up in the Troubles. Um, lots of bad stuff happened to my family. Um, it's informed by loads of relations who are in the police and weird stuff happened to them. Funny things, dark things. So that's a bit of interesting backstory. And I've done various interesting things in my life, you know, in, in doing radio programs and journalism around the world. So I could talk about that stuff. Um, Steve is, is a kind of a gift to anyone because, you know, he worked on QI, New Museum of Curiosity, and he's got a million stories from when he was in the police. You know, like when he was a good friend of Freddie Mercury and that sort of thing. 
<laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating, but he's got loads of good stories. And the, uh, one of the guys that I think is is the best at this lives locally, and he's called Tony Kent. Uh, that's mm. that's his writer's name, anyway. Uh, really nice guy, and he's uh, written two of his first book. Yeah. Killer Intent, and it rhymes with the surname, Tony Kent. Anyway, he's written various ones, and they're thrillers, and they're good. I enjoy them. But one of the good things about him is he was so easy to get on any radio program you'd like because he was a champion boxer. Uh, he came from a slightly villainous family and got into becoming a QC or a, a, a lawyer, a barrister, when watching another barrister um, expose the police officer who was trying to fit up his brother who was a bit of a criminal, but on this occasion was innocent. And he was also a stuntman in films like The Mummy and Gladiator, that rides a horse and that. So you're thinking, I don't really care what he's written. Let's just get him on for a chat. This is fabulous. So the same thing for all, all of us. When somebody's going to want to talk to you or maybe even just spend time with you, are you an interesting person? And maybe in the olden days, writers could just, it didn't matter who they were, people, just were interested in the quality of their work, which is maybe how it should be. These days, it seems that's not the case. And you need to have a bit of a, a, a backstory. Imagine you're going on the X Factor and you're not just going to sing, they're going to say, oh, my terrible. So Neil would be going, oh, my terrible time in hospital, but I've overcome this tragedy and I'm now going to sing a song. So it's not something as crass as that, but you've got to think, what are the interesting things about me a little package that I'm going to say, you know, I've written this book and who are you? Oh, well, I've done this and that, or I maybe I'm related to this or I have this interesting background. So it can seem a bit like blowing your own trumpet to think about that. So maybe you can do it with somebody else and, you know, you do them and they do you, somebody who knows you. And so you're not hiding behind modesty, but you, should, you need to come up with something like that. And uh, then, um, you're going to be thinking, oh, yeah, the other thing is social media is a curse because it distracts you and it sucks in your time uh, and it's just really awful. However, you kind of have to do it because, again, some agents and publishers will be thinking, does this person have an audience? Do they, uh, are they popular? Who's going to buy their book? Are they a complete unknown? And if you are, then... It does. It's not necessarily a bar, but it makes it a little bit harder for you. Whereas if you have uh, like an audience already who are interested in what you say and don't hate you, then that makes you a better um, a better bet for them. I, I what I mean is if you're not all being blocked by everyone all the time or friends with the whole of QAnon or something. Um, and uh, so that means that you have to use social media to some extent. But if you suddenly start doing it now, oh, my book's about to come out. I'm going on Facebook. Everyone buy my book. Nobody will be interested because you're clearly so incredibly mercenary. You're not really wanting to be friends with them at all. You don't care about them. You just want to say, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. So you have to have already been on social media. So you can either genuinely or give the impression that you're not doing it purely to sell stuff to them. And so you've got a bit of time to build things up. And if you're being normal, you'd be saying, maybe supporting other people along the way, encouraging them, comment, commenting on their stuff, rather than it just being all me, me, me. And so I've found like um, kind of crime writing people, because what I do, I suppose, is a bit that, to be really supportive and encouraging. And, you know, they celebrate other people's book launches. Um, they, they they say nice things about each other. It's It's... I thought it was quite unexpected. Events by far are the best thing for me for selling books, which is part of why COVID has hit my business so hard. Um, I think, yeah, I think they're great to do. I know that it's not for everybody and it can feel quite uncomfortable sitting at a stall and being like, hi, these are my books. <laughs> it's a bit odd, but um, because when you buy author copies of your books, you get them at such a reduced rate, you're not having to pay Amazon or whoever for the joy of them, them stocking it. You make a lot more money through selling them in person. And also, again, where you don't have a marketing machine, 
you sorry my dog's drinking if you can hear that um she if it means that you are there people can meet you it's just another way of people stumbling across you when you're not a times bestseller so the kind of things I do I've done some book signings so you can go to your local bookshop and say hello I'm a local author please could I do a signing you can set things up whereby you bring your own books um and then you pay them they pay you you know <laughs> you figure it out so you split the money that's what i'm looking for um so i've done that you can do that at libraries as well i've done quite a few craft fairs craft fairs are nice because you don't have any competition often um or if you do it's from something like Osborne. so um that can be nice when you've got people who are looking for gifts um particularly if you've got something like children's books or something a bit different that someone might might like to pick up um so that can be really good around sort of christmas time as well and easter um, I've done weird local events, like little weird regatta type, you know, just, you know, your little local events. And I, if, if I can afford a stall, I'll be there kind of situation. I've also done things that are relevant to the topic. So with milk, I've done several things at breastfeeding related stuff. So I've done a breastfeeding festival. I've done some sort of baby um, events where it's sort of for for expectant and new parents and, and I've gone along to those so you can do that if your book's about something specific if there's an event you can find where it actually ties in with what you've written about um, I've also done a little bit of speaking um, which you can get paid for but not always um, but even if you're just there and it can raise awareness and someone might buy your book I have done local radio which is fun um, I've Dane has interviewed me which is lovely I've also worked with a couple of my local radio stations here and um, virtual events such as this one so um, thank you for having me this this evening for that so there's lots I think events are really good if you can physically sell your author copies that's going to be your highest royalty rate and people find you and even if you're doing things where you're not necessarily selling a, a physical book but you're just getting your writing out there but by being somewhere in person and talking to people in person is just the best way to do it if you can, but obviously current situation. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about schools because it's something I have sort of a, a, a more experience than a lot of people because I've worked in schools for such a long time. Um, so you, if your book is appropriate, you know, obviously it's not, not everybody can go and work with schools. Um, you can set up going in to do book readings, to do meet an author days. You can do workshops about all sorts of things. So I've done workshops on editing. I've done workshops on rock pools. I've done like basically anything you can weave into what your book is about. Um, and obviously you can do that for primary or for secondary. So if your book is appropriate, but not proper children's, you know, um, then you could still go into a secondary school because they love talk, being able to talk to um, people who really work in a field that they're interested in. So schools often are looking for people and in fact the school I used to work at used to do something called speed dating and they would have loads of professionals from the community come in and the kids would go around like you would on a speed date they get five minutes with each professional so there's all sorts of things schools do if they know that you're a writer in the community um, then um, you, you can get some work through them and with that you get your income from your your day fee and you get book sales as well. So it can be a really, really good way of making a bit of money. Um, what I've said on there is do stick to industry standard fees. It's really frowned on to undercut everybody and do really cheap, because actually it is a lot of work. Um, so if you look up um, what's kind of accepted as industry standard at a time when you're choosing to do it, you, you can go a little bit under and you can do deals as well. So you can do things like a half price offer or um, you only have to pay half price if you promise to buy 20 books or however you want to work it, but it is just quite frowned on to, to do it for cheap. 